Well, hey, East Lake, it's Kristen, and I'm here with Peter and our wonderful guest that I'm so excited to be talking to today, Felina Nicole. And we have heard from Felina for years now, and um, I'm just so grateful to have this chance to talk with her today. Um, Felina, welcome back to East Lake in the form that it is now, which is a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's apropos, actually, that uh, East Lake has taken various forms and is in the process of change and growth in different ways, which is uh, really in line with the topic we're going to be discussing today, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So we have been having these different conversations kind of after we've read portions of this book by Sasha Sagan. And um, Peter and I were talking through what should our next discussion be? And we were getting, you know, all of us looking at hoping for the end of winter. And we kind of said, let's do a springtime discussion. And you were the name that came to my mind of who could we talk to that would have such a special reflection on rebirth and reemergence and the things that are so defined in nature um, that we see all around us in springtime. And then also personally, as we all try to kind of um, step into what's next for all of our lives and springtime seems kind of like a, a time to think about that. And so thanks for, being willing to have this conversation with us. Um, I think I wanted to start by just asking you about rituals in general. Um, my first memory of you was, gosh, I wish I would have looked at the year, but there was an Eastlake leadership retreat um, on Woodby Island. Peter Reed. I remember that. this. Yes, I remember. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but... <laughs> I picked you up at the ferry and we had this house rented. And this was kind of, honestly, I think, Peter, one of our first ventures into um, new, I would just call them experiences or even rituals where Felina kind of brought these ideas of silence and solitude mm -hmm. and stillness. And those were new for me. Yeah. And do, I don't know if you remember, you also did <laughs> yoga and we were all just giggly. Oh, uh, showing the messes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I remember like fumbling through, like trying to do like a 30 second meditation. Yeah. And I was just like, this is impossible. I can't possibly fit here for 30 seconds. Like it, it's literally like being around my, my four-year-old now. Right. Anyways, I'm sure your experience of us was really mature. <laughs> I just, oh, I remember it so clearly, you guys. It was yeah. really fun. And you were all in, even though it was strange and different. And everybody had such a great attitude. I just, it's funny because I'm struck with this memory of George in some sort of yoga pants <laughs> and I just saw George oh, um really in fun. Scottsdale yeah I just saw him a few days ago and so anyway everything's kind of coming back together here in our conversation with all these memories I such good memories with you all oh my gosh well thanks for being patient with us over the years because I think anytime you try on like new habits or new rituals it can feel um new and uncomfortable. And so I just appreciate that you've been a part of that expansion for at least me and for lots of people. He's like, and I guess I just wanted to know, like, how did you, um, how did you get to the point where those were kind of the things that were really important to you and became kind of centering to your spirituality? Yeah. Wonderful way to start, uh, that we kind of met at that con convergence of solitude, silence, and stillness being important rituals or practices in our life. Uh, and those coming out of a contemplative spiritual kind of tradition or contemplative spirituality tradition. And for me, the way I came into that was um, really out of a place of crisis of faith. I grew up in the Christian evangelical tradition I spent many years in service around the world with children in poverty and women and girls coming out of the commercial sex trade and 
uh, survivors of war. And uh, needless to say, I uh, experienced a huge wake up call in terms of uh, worldview and the limited worldview that I had before and, um, and, and really the way in which um, some of my religious beliefs and ideals um, weren't measuring up to reality. So uh, after those experiences, uh, I came into this place of crisis of faith, met a Cistercian monk um, who takes Cistercian and Trappist are interchangeable. So some of the listeners may have heard of Trappist monks, um, one of the famous being Thomas Merton. And so in that tradition, that spiritual tradition, I met a monk who um, introduced me to the contemplative um, spirituality and the practice of centering prayer, uh, a mm-hmm. meditation practice. And that was Thomas Keating, one of the architects of the centering prayer method and the international organization called Contemplative Outreach. So at any rate, I came to appreciate uh, some of the um, some of the ways in which uh, solitude, silence, and stillness can support and evolving faith, really. Um, and I guess one of the things I want to ask you is like, it's been quite a lot that has gone on in the last few years for us as a society. And I know for you personally, and I guess I'm wondering, are these things, have you found these are still the rituals that you need or have things, Mm -hmm. have you found new ones and new things that really like feed your soul? Mm, Great question. It's interesting, Kristen, in my own life, um, the year the pandemic hit, I experienced um, a, a couple of different, uh, very traumatic uh, events. And I know a lot of us uh, as a society experienced the trauma of the pandemic itself. So in many ways, um, a lot of us went into like a survival mode. Um, Gosh, I remember so clearly actually um, being on the phone with a friend from Seattle because the, I was in the Midwest and she was in Seattle and the pandemic was taking on greater proportions on the coast than it than had yet hit the Midwest. And she was telling me what was happening there, the runs on the groceries, you know, the runs on supplies and all these things. And I'm just like, what in the world is this? really happening. And then it wasn't long after, right, that it started happening in my town. And, uh, and so you saw this uh, heightened anxiety, you experienced, you know, all of us kind of experienced a heightened anxiety, collective anxiety, and all of us kind of being in this survival mode, like what's going to happen? How do I survive this? Well, trauma is um, a response that happens in our nervous system when our life feels threatened, whether that's a a real threat or a perceived one. And so uh, at any rate, for me personally, um, I had some other experiences that year that put me into um, a trauma mode. And so the practices of solitude, silence, and stillness that had sustained me up to that point um, really did uh, take a different seat in my life. Because um, in the experience of trauma, uh, we're trying to survive and get to a place of regulation. And so I actually started to adopt other practices um, that helped me self-regulate. And, uh, and so those took uh, precedence. And uh, things like a silent meditation were actually pretty difficult for, for me because I was not in a state of peace, my nervous system was on high alert, which makes uh, some of the traditional kinds of meditation practices difficult during that time period. So, or like when we're experiencing high levels of stress or trauma. And so I think that might be important to mention here in the discussion, because uh, it's one thing to talk about spiritual practice under normal, regulated um, ways of being. But if any of us are under high levels of stress or ex- recovering from trauma, then we have to adjust. That's been my experience anyway. 
I think it's very helpful to di- uh, differentiate or distinguish. I- I'm curious too, because um, I want to ask some dumb questions just in case there's anybody listening who's like, can you say that a little bit differently? Because I-, I have a, a seven-year-old who we talk to um, because he's navigating some, he's he's on high alert a lot, right? So we're, we're kind of determining that, well, I think his zero to 10 is a little bit, he goes from zero to 10 easier than some of our other kids. So he can experience the same type of thing, but it's hard for him to regulate. So can you kind of share even just from your perspective, like what does it mean to regulate our emotions or to be in a space mm-hmm. where we are regulated? And yeah. and then if you're open to sharing, like what are those, what are some of the practices that help you regulate? Um, Cause I, <laughs> I'm asking for a friend, AKA myself <laughs> when I'm triggered, um, because I'm interested <laughs> to hear kind of how you define regulation and then what, what helps you get to a place of regulation. Yeah, really good question. So regulation is is about uh, bringing the nervous system back to a state of like homeostasis where uh, we are no longer in a fight, flight, freeze or fawn state. And so, you know, we share with um, all the other animals in nature, this survival response when our life feels under threat, uh, perceived or or real. And, um, and so that's really essential because uh, sometimes we can downplay what's happening in our nervous system when we're highly stressed uh, because we think, oh, you know, like rationally, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm not facing a life or death situation here. It doesn't matter if it's registering to the nervous system as life and death. We have to tend to what is, what is really happening in our physicality. So the nervous system will go into a fight flight, freeze, or fawn state to survive. So it's um, each one of those states is a way of self-protecting, surviving. So to regulate then means to help the nervous system experience, I am safe. I don't have to be in survival mode. And some of the ways we do that is um, through breath techniques, um, working with the breath and working then with the vagus nerve, um, which is the longest uh, nerve in the body that um, actually when we can work with the body, we signal to the brain that I am safe. Everything is okay. And um, various breath techniques work with that. There's another uh, technique that took the place of uh, my meditation practice for quite some time that I learned from a trauma therapist uh, called uh, trauma or tension release exercise, which is really interesting, uh, which is um, stimulating the uh, the psoas muscle in the legs to allow the body to shake, which is what we see uh, animals, animals doing yeah. in the natural world, right? Mm-hmm. I wonder, has Sasha mentioned any of that in her book? She No, she didn't talk about that. But as yeah. as said, shake, I've heard that from somewhere else though. Yeah. That, that was, I have a memory of that. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm looking at my dog Basil over here on the sofa and whenever he experiences stress, um, whether it's, it really doesn't have to be a negative or positive thing. It's just stress to the system, which creates tension in the body whenever that happens for him. And he gets to a place of, okay, the stress is over. The stressful situation is over. Then he shakes and he releases all that tension and he goes on his way and he doesn't hold on to a story around what happened <laughs> and how that now yeah. defines him. You know, it's really right. awesome to watch. Replay he's conversation so for years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, he just goes on his merry way and he's back in bliss and he's running around the ranch and enjoying his best life. So anyway, um, experiences of, uh, of that type of thing where we can shake uh, the body free of that tension is super helpful. It gets us back to that regulated state. I remember when we were talking with Sarah Hansen about anxiety, this was a conversation a long time ago, and I was asking her about, um, I don't know, I, I don't know the context, but she said, basically, like, sometimes she tells her clients to drop and do pushups when they're in the moment of feeling mm-hmm. that because when you can make your body work um it can take some of the stress i don't know do you remember that peter yeah well even if you think about like the importance of different types of breathing exercises or like 
when you're doing push-ups, you breathe a little bit harder than when you're sitting at a desk um, yeah. chatting on Zoom. So like whether it's the breathing or the physical exertion, um, I was I was listening to a audio book talking about the number one um, antidepressant you could ever give your body um, is to exercise. Like if you if you make a life commitment to exercise, um, that was like that is just a, a massive uh, impact to your ability to stay in a place, hopefully of avoiding some of the challenges. Not to say that's what everybody needs. I'm more just speaking to it. Like humans need to be moving. Um, so I'm not surprised that mm-hmm. she brought that up too. Yeah. Another um, way that I have learned and appreciated how to regulate, which comes into also kind of feeds into ritual. And I think connects in with the book that you're reading more uh, is I, I have now relocated to a ranch in Northern New Mexico, a, a large ranch, and there's a lot of open space and I'm just drenched in nature. I'm also drenched in solitude, silence, and stillness, <laughs> but this nature piece has been an added gift to my life coming from really always being in urban centers until now, um, except for when I would retreat. Now I'm living in nature with the natural world and I'm very uh, attuned to my natural environment and I'm hiking every day and to be in, in nature has a way of um, synchronizing our nervous system to our surroundings, which I think speaks to, you know, a lot of the pressure many of us experience in urban centers because our nervous system is co-regulating with our environment all the time. And, uh, and that's why I've experienced such a difference living in a natural environment where mm. uh, anxiety is at an all time low. I mean, it's just not in my environment unless I create it because really mm. it's, it's the human world that creates anxiety. Uh, the natural world lives in harmony with the natural rhythms of life and those things that occur. And so while um, the animal kingdom might experience stress, uh, they're not living with chronic anxiety like many of us are in the urban centers. And so our environment is critical because if we consider that we're always co-regulating with one another and with our environment, then we have to pay attention to what is informing our nervous system. Mm. Oof, that's super... (laughs) important and little rough to think about. <laughs> um, no, I, I, no, I resonate with what you're speaking to um, in seasons when, I mean, I think that's even partly why I find winter harder just because it's harder to be outside. There's, there's natural hiccups, right? When it's four o'clock and I'm done with the work day, four 30 and the sun is gone for a half an hour, <laughs> right? I, uh, you get up and it's dark and you go to, um, you're done with work and it's dark. It can uh, be a hurdle to, feeling synchronized with the natural world, I think. Um, so anyways, I just, I just enjoy what you're showing. You sound like you had a question, Kristen, because I want to go di- another direction too. But Well, I was just different. thinking about how winter can kind of feel like survival mode a little bit and mm-hmm. how plants and animals all kind of like close, they like close up for <laughs> winter. Um, and... So I was just thinking about that parallel and now how like the bunnies have reemerged into our yard and (laughs) my kids and I go check our maple trees for looking for the first sign of a leaf that's going to come and how, um, yes, we're urban centered and have a lot going on. And Peter and I have talked about this in other messages, like we can go and buy strawberries in January. But there is, if you pay attention, there is just a a reemergence that happens naturally in spring. Like we are reemerging, we are seeing families at the park, we are see, doing things outside, and so I guess um, as we're talking through springtime specifically, um, Felina, I'm curious about like that idea of reemergence and rebirth that happens in nature all around us and within ourselves. So I guess I just wanted to ask you what that kind of terms and what that makes you think about when you think about reemergence and rebirth. Mm, Yeah, I love that. It's making me think about my experience of late uh, reemergence, rebirth, and how 
critical it is to adapt and adjust to the seasons and cycles of our life hmm. uh, that we are not meant to be running at a particular pace all the time that we've we fluctuate like that's nature right and so this four seasons are a beautiful way of, of illustrating that uh, that there is a winter season and that is a slowing down season of kind of coming into ourself um, more perhaps self-protection to survive uh, the elements. Um, there's, uh, yeah, even then the plants and that sort of thing, a lot of plants appear to die, right? Uh, and, and so that, as we look at, you know, how that happens in the natural world, if we consider our own experiences, there are seasons that might not coincide with the same um, cycle in nature in terms of when it's winter out there, it might be springtime in here, who knows? <laughs> but the point is like, let's pay attention to um, when we are in a, a, a wintering state or um, an autumn state and, uh, and make adjustments accordingly. I think in my own life, I've seen my tendency to try and push through seasons of my life where um, I'm really meant to kind of come into myself, hibernate in a way, take slow down, take time uh, to uh, find restoration and recovery and that sort of thing. And, um, and that naturally will have an impact on my productivity, for example. And I've seen my tendency to kind of push against that. And at this point in my life, the resounding theme is how do I get in sync with the natural rhythms and pace of my life, the way it's ebbing and flowing? I, I think of um, God, uh, great spirit, the spiritual element of life, like a good river. And um, to see how the river is flowing, to pay attention and how sometimes it's flowing rapidly and there's like all oh, this great stuff going on and the waters are full of new life and, and creativity and all these beautiful things happening. And then at other times, um, you know, I'm like in an eddy and the waters are really calm and it's time to just kind of take, you know, slow down and take a break and that sort of thing. So really paying attention to how do I get in sync with that good river of life, that life force, and not swim upstream or go against the current, but flow with it. And when it's quiet and the waters aren't flowing very much, like find ways to really honor that and get in sync with it rather than being, yeah, against the flow. Hey Eastlake, Peter here. Thanks so much for tuning in to watch this message. I wanted to do just a quick interruption to say thank you to so many of you who are making regular contributions to Eastlake. Eastlake is a nonprofit and everything that we do is because of a community of consistent and generous people who really believe in this place and want to see it continue. So uh, if you're a part of that community, thank you for how you make this place go. If you are tuning in regularly and are part of this community, but you haven't yet um, jumped in to making a financial contribution, we would encourage you to do that and encourage you to go to eastlakecc.com to help support Eastlake as a community and continue to make these messages possible. Thanks so much for uh, letting me interrupt your message. Let's jump back in. A big theme of your life is how do I get in sync with the natural rhythms of the world or of spirit? Like, I mean, probably those are maybe inter interchangeable for you. And as, um, well, did I get that right? Let me start with that. Does that sound right? Like that's feeling like a, yeah. an important theme right now. Yeah. I guess to, to really clarify, it would be like, how do I get in sync with, with life force? And I guess I see mm -hmm. the river as an, as a metaphor for life force, right? Uh, so how yeah. do I synchronize with that? Because that, like a river, is it's changing, it's ebbing and flowing. Yeah. Would you say that your like the purpose of your rituals or your practices is to synchronize with that life force, or are there other things that people like as, as a listener, if 
one, I'm, I'm interested in hearing like, how long does it take you to notice that you're out of sync? <laughs> because like, <laughs> I could imagine myself like, like calling it a hurdle or this is like, I need to overcome and I got to be strong, right? Like when, when I'm out of sync and like I'm fighting an uphill battle, right? I could see myself, my first response not being, ooh, I need to like adjust to where the natural flow of life is going. I could see myself like, I'm going to will this. I'm going to, you know, like the motivational quotes, right? Like you get down six times, you get up seven or you, you know, if I can't <laughs> knock on too many doors, you got to kick one down eventually, right? So like that, that seems to be out of sync with like the typical American society, at least the motivational memes I'm seeing, right? Um, so I'm curious, like how, how do you get better at noticing when you're out of sync? Mm-hmm. Really perceptive, Peter, um, the way you're looking at all that. For me, how do I know when I'm out of sync? I mean, it's just, gosh, it's like, I, I think my whole adulthood has been about learning how to recognize that. Um, and it shows up in things like, um, over the years, it's shown up as health issues, physical health issues that because I wasn't tuned in along the way. So then these health problems manifested, you know, that I, I couldn't ignore anymore. I don't generally let it get that, that far, um, at this point in my life, but, um, other signs that I'm out of sync are things like, um, my sleeping patterns, like if I'm having more disrupted sleep, uh, if I'm turning to uh, things like caffeine or alcohol, um, more like not just in a kind of uh, moderated kind of way, but I'm like having it more than I normally do or something like that. That's a big, that's a big sign that I'm beginning to get out of sync. Um, that and the sleep really stand out to me. I feel like too, Peter, what you were kind of hinting at, um, I think there's a tendency for people or I'll speak for myself. There's a tendency for me because I have an evangelical religious background to really just, um, be religious about my approaches to things and my religious not just in terms of like okay I'm going to be very committed this is what's required and I'm going to do it every day and I think kind of what Felina what I hear you speaking to is that um that can kind of cover what's actually going on inside of me which is maybe the need to rest or the need to not push um I think I just repeated what peter said but i was listening no, to it from a, you said something different okay i heard it differently well and i think it's like um peter always talks about habits and like how do you create yeah. healthy habits and i think it can be easier some in some ways to set up a routine even a routine of rituals that you're like i'm committed to doing this mm-hmm. um when that might not be what you actually need. For sure. And this kind of brings me to a question that I thought I was going to go down the path of earlier, but you asked an awesome one. So we didn't go there, but I was thinking about you sharing. I mean, you have decades of contemplative practice under your belt, right? And to then arrive at a place where you're like, these no longer are serving me, or maybe I'm going to tweak how they're playing out in my life to try different practices. I think that that's interesting to me is like, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Like I could see myself like for years, as Kristen talked about, like just being like, this is how I live my life. And I could just not be giving myself what I actually need because I can kind of live in my delusion of like, I'm going to power through. So anyways, I'm interested in kind of how you notice that, or obviously you shared a little bit on that, but I feel like that's a big move for somebody who's a lot has a lot of years of contemplative practice under your belt to then choose to maybe put those aside for a season. Yeah. And, you know, really, as I'm looking at that, I'm realizing that the elements of solitude, silence, and stillness, which make up what 
what I have um, understood and experience of contemplative spirituality, um, those those practices took different shape. So the practices of solitude, silence, and stillness were still a part of my life, mm. but it wasn't that religious, I got to show up for my meditation sit, you know, at least right. twice a day. Mm-hmm. It took the form of, um, I actually need to do a yoga nidra at least twice a day, or I need to um, be in nature more. Uh, and we only have so many minutes of a day, right? And so I had to adjust what was most um, important for me during a particular season of my life. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Mm-hmm. It does. Yep. I was thinking about what you just said, um, or a few minutes ago, Felina, you talked about um, things appearing to be dead or to have died. Like I'm looking out my window right now and I see my favorite maple trees that line our driveway and they're just literally brown sticks still. They look dead. Um, And I think part of why springtime can be so thrilling is that something that looks dead actually isn't. And Sasha Sagan wrote about that in the book that we're reading, I don't know if I can find it in my notes here, but um, the tree that seems dead, but isn't something new is growing. The weather will be better soon. The days will be longer. The sunshine is coming. It still feels magical, miraculous, even. And I had it on that section too. It's so beautiful. I think my question in all of that is, um surrounding the word hope and i'm curious what that word means to you um it's a word that i have struggled with a lot over the years um so i guess i just want to leave it at do you what is what does the word hope mean to you mm. When I hear you mention it and the way you're reflecting on it, I am immediately drawn to my experiences of the last few years and um, it, having experienced um, the worst personal traumas in my life up to that point and facing um, experiences of really not having hope and um, yeah, struggling through various circumstances in my life to have then really made this passage uh, from death into a, a pretty significant rebirth in my life in practical ways, the way my life has changed. Uh, I am connected to this knowing now that I didn't have before around hope that the universe, the spiritual order is something I can trust. Even if my experiences in the moment are pain and suffering, there is this knowing like I've never known before that the pain and suffering does not have the last word, that there is this promise of renewal, reemergence, rebirth, just like that tree outside your window. You know, that is not its its end. And if it was at the end of its life cycle, the beauty of the decomposition of the matter of that tree giving life to other life forms, it's pretty incredible. And so for me to experience that in my own human uh, existence that I've lost a lot of things in my life. A lot of things in my life have died, uh, but they are like giving life to new expressions of life now. It's never, so that to me just gives me a lot of hope. Thanks so beautiful. 
That's really beautiful. I don't have anything to say to that. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I was only going to, uh, you triggered a thought about how when you're, I think when you're going through pain, it's different to hear people talk about hope than if you've come through pain, right? So on the other side of pain, I think it's easier to like resonate with being hopeful um, than when you're in the midst of feeling like my situation is terrible and it's hard for me to hope that it will get better. So I love that like you're speaking to an inherent trust that that you, you can hope because it feels vulnerable to hope for the future when you're in the midst of a lot of hardship. Um, and I think I'm still challenged to like, I think all of fear, like if I'm fearful about the future, fearful about loss, that's rooted in not trusting that it will, I, I have reason to hope um, that I can hope for the future. Um, so even to just th- to hear someone who you would say has gone through some major loss in the last season to encourage us that there's reason to hope and reason to trust. Um, it's just really encouraging. You know, Peter, as you're saying that, I'm thinking too of um, some of the teaching of um, Ignatius of Loyola, a Jesuit uh, who lived 500 some years ago talking about consolations and desolations and he taught this prayer that the examine or the examen and the teaching there was uh really around knowing that there are these cycles these principles of yes we will experience desolation in our life where things just feel hopeless uh and we will experience consolations where things really seem wonderful and that um the point is that when we are experienced in desolation to remember consolations are the other side of that and um, when we're experiencing consolations to also remember that this doesn't last continually it's a Mm -hmm. cycle you know an ebb and a flow and i'm thinking of a, a dear um spiritual director in the jesuit tradition who uh who has said um in a in a season of suffering in my life suffer well so that we don't skip over the experience of the pain and suffering but we let it do its work but underneath all of that hopefully we can begin to tap into that inherent trust in these rhythms and cycles of pain and suffering and joy and bliss and death and rebirth and you know if we don't we don't none of us get to um escape these natural rhythms of life that we see in nature and we experience in our nature our human nature it's all it's all a part of the human experience so do it well whatever season Mm -hmm. you're in you know and let that work be done to you yeah, that's challenging. <laughs> so don't like whine, whine and try to skip through it and suppress it and shove it down. Oh, okay, got it. I need to work on that. I know. <laughs> it's like, you know, when we're experiencing pain and suffering, I'm imagining my own experiences. It's like, oh my gosh, like we can go, you know, all out with like the kicking and screaming that comes with this is not what I want, you know, and I am not getting my way. We can throw a temper tantrum, you know, about it. And just resist it to the hilt. And, um, or, you know, over time, we can begin to remember this isn't the end. This may look terrible, uh, but perhaps it's not. Like, perhaps there's something at work in me that is crucial to my capacity to live a full life, to reach more of my potential to gain access to my essential self. Maybe this is a part of that. And can I trust that? And can I surrender to it a little bit more? It's so true. And yet I know when I'm in those seasons, it's really, it's really hard. It is <laughs> but super I think it's, hard. It's, um, I think everybody knows after you've lived for a while it just is part of life I think one of the things that Sasha does so well in this book is she just shows how every religion every culture um 
has developed practices or ways of honoring what is just true about life and nature. And um, I think that's one of the things that I've really appreciated about this is remembering what is um, essentially true about life and how that's reflected in nature and how it's then reflected in every religion and culture on earth. Everybody has celebrations of the sun and of the solstice and of, um, you know, joy and aging and all of these things that are so just up. It's just what life is going to be. And I think what we're trying to do in these conversations is give ourselves kind of tangible ways of marking those things. Um, I think even what you just said is there's a tangible way to mark when you're in the winter and when you're in those moments of like pain and suffering. And those might be to just let yourself experience it and also remember that it's part of a cycle and it won't always be this way. And I think that's one of the important things about spring is just the overwhelming feeling of like, oh, we made it through. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I, I can trust that i can hope right even if it's a, obviously i can hope for more light and i i whine every year i love the golf Selena, so i i whine january and february because there's no time and it's freezing and i actually do golf and i don't even enjoy it because it's so cold so spring is like this marker of hope for the seasons but if you think about spring it's just a symbol um of when we're in hardship that we can trust that there's going to be new life and a rebirth I think it's a really beautiful idea, Kristen. Peter, you did golf in the winter and you had an albatross, correct? That's true. That's true. It is a and crazy experience. You sent me a video and you were in down coat and wool hat. The <laughs> greatest shot of my life. Yeah, it, it's irrelevant. It'll never happen again. Not with that attitude. I just feel like I maybe, we should just, maybe we should just tell people that so that you can have the thrill of <laughs> I feel like almost everybody on planet Earth knows at this point. So <laughs> I wouldn't have been shy about it. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So I'm looking through. Peter, do you have other things you want to ask? I, I, one of the thoughts I was um, reflecting on as you're sharing, you brought up just um, the idea. We talked about re regulation a little bit earlier, and we talked about um, silence, solitude, and stillness. And obviously, you've given a lot of your life to that. And there's two things that I was thinking. One is like, how do we make the topic of regulation and like helping people understand this a lot more commonplace in our society to like or even to have the knowledge of like, I think I'm in a highly triggered state right now, or I'm in, you know, fight or flight freeze mode. Um, so I was just wondering, obviously you, you're to ask you like, how do we make these things more um, accessible or more highlighted? You're like, Peter, this is my entire life's work. So how dare you say that? But <laughs> of course we want that more so. Um, but I was, I was more just curious, like as you think through, how do we kind of continue to elevate that? Um, like how, how would you recommend that? And then I, I was also thinking about, like I work at like a corporate job, um, nine to five and I have kids and basketball practices and, a lot of times at night I'm exhausted and it's like, all right, let's kick on sports center or Netflix. And I was kind of like, what is um, silent, silent solitude and stillness for dummies or for people that maybe are needing baby steps to get to a place where they recognize how important it is in their life. Um, kind of like what's the, the gateway drug to be a full, um, a full participant in silent solitude and stillness. I think there's two things like, how do we make it more, like how do we help people recognize that they need this in their, their life? And then what's like the first step you would encourage for people to incorporate some of these rituals into their, into their regular practice? Yeah. One of the things that's coming to mind is what you're pointing to Peter, like really raising consciousness around uh, self awareness, really. Um, paying attention to what's happening for us. When are we activated or dysregulated? When are we um, moving out of that state of homeostasis where we're pretty much at peace with ourselves, our environment, our community, we're in the flow, things are 
relatively fine. And then, you know, like noticing when we get activated uh, and which is interestingly, um, I'm just kind of making this connection now. Um, when we get triggered, usually it's happening in relationship to someone else or a circumstance or situation, right? That's actually connected to uh, to a state in our younger life experience that was traumatic. And so we're tapping into old di- old dysregulation. So that's really important to begin to understand uh, that when we're activated um, at various um, levels, we're, we're either experiencing in the moment a trauma to the nervous system, or we're tapping into old trauma that was never fully resolved. And it's um, then, then helping people know how to resolve those those kinds of traumas. That's a whole other podcast probably. (laughs) But at any rate, I think just the um, raising consciousness is easy in that we're just talk, you know, we just talk about it, that we don't have to be ashamed of being activated or dysregulated, but we can begin noticing it. And then perhaps just bringing it up more in conversation. Like my partner, David and I, um, we're in community at the ranch and uh, and it's inevitable that people are going to get activated by one another and not act in their best self, you know? And so yeah. just naming it when it happens, oh, I got activated here. You know, I'm really sorry. Like, this is what was going on for me. Or, hey, I noticed you got activated here. Can you help me understand what's going on for you? You know? So just that initial awareness and then talking about it. And from there, you know, really the sky's the limit in terms of educating ourselves about um, what we know now of trauma and regulation, dysregulation, and how to how to be responsible human beings when it comes to all that. Yeah, I do. I think love that. Just a, the language. Oh, sorry, Kristen. <laughs> I do think there's like a new um, awareness of this when it comes to parenting too that's happening now, and so hopefully we're raising a new generation that is, and they'll have, you know, their own things that <laughs> we're doing wrong and they'll need therapy for over years. But um, I feel like there is this general, like um, a different approach to parenting that's happening where we're not shutting kids down. We're helping them recognize their feelings and work through their feelings. And we're kind of stumbling along in it because I think it's different than at least the way that, you know, my group of friends has identified being raised, you know? And so I think that that helps too. You're just, there's always hope with the next generation that things can be a little bit different and they'll have a different kind of language um, that we're trying to teach them. So that's helpful. And different, yeah. And different skills, right. That maybe our parents didn't know or have. Yeah. To teach us. Yeah. I I noticed her language. Was sorry, I was just going to mention that I noticed her language is like it's just a new form of communicating about emotion. Um, so even using language like I noticed you were activated is so much different when somebody, if someone would say that to me, um, than to hear I noticed you were being a big jerk, uh, or I noticed you were right, like the <laughs> why did you freak there, out? <laughs> oh, why did you freak out? I, it, there's some inherent like shaming of I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't like that wasn't a, a normal human experience, that was a terrible thing, and a good person wouldn't have done that. Um, so anyway, I, I love even just having some more neutral language, um, that we could offer in our conversations with our kids or our partners or our community, um, to acknowledge that it's a common thing. Um, so anyway, I thought you, there's, there's just some great thoughts to think on from what you shared. What were you saying, Kristen? I over, overspoke um, on you. Well, I was going to say too, Felina, your book, Mindful Silence, I think is still really, um, helpful in this time. Um, so if anyone hasn't read that, that was, um, one of my favorites that I read over the last few years. So, um, you, Peter, you were asking like, what kinds of ideas do you have for helping people cultivate that? Mm-hmm. And I would, I'm answering for you. <laughs> Felina. It's great. So you don't have to say, go buy my book. I'm going to say, you guys should read Felina's book, Mindful Silence. Um, that's one of my favorites that we've like read over the years with people that we've interacted with. So. Yes. And then I will make a shameless um, plug for Pilgrimage of a Soul, too, yeah. because uh, in that book, I 
I reflect quite a bit on these cycles of life that we go through. And I use language like for the each each of the chapters around like awakening, longing, darkness, death, mm. transformation, rebirth, int- intimacy, and union. Um, and so, you know, really th- those themes I think can be helpful in this overall discussion on rebirth. Mm-hmm. I think my my last question is, um, do you have any rituals or ideas of rituals that might help us kind of lean into newness and new growth and things like that? Like I'm telling you from this book, I'm doing the Blossom Day with my kids, which is watching every day for um, new growth on the trees. And we're we have a garden that, you know, we're actively planning for right now. It's been so cold. It's not, we're not doing it quite yet, but those to me are really ritualistic that help us, my family kind of step into newness and growth literally with nature. But what about for us as humans? And I was curious if you have ideas about that. Mm -hmm. What came to mind is something that I spontaneously did um, during a season of um, particular disruption and trauma. And, uh, I was in the throes of, you know, really big suffering, personal suffering. And, um, yeah, it was, gosh, that was just incredible. There's more to say about that, that we don't have time for, but at any rate it was a period of great darkness in my life and death. And I was, um, yeah, I mean, I was really struggling to find any hope for my for my life. And I was very much activated. My nervous system was completely dysregulated. And I couldn't sit in a meditation sit. But I thought I had enough intuition to know that a hot bath might do me good. So I took a hot bath, but this was the thing that was different. Um, I had all these herbs that I had used in another ritual that I would do annually at the winter solstice uh, in a burning ceremony, a clearing and a cleansing kind of ritual. Uh, I had all these herbs from that and I decided to put them in the bath water and like soak in these herbs and these plants, these blossoms. And those particular herbs, I already knew what their meaning was. You can look up the meaning of different plants and such. And that had an an extra layer of uh, meaning for me. And I just, I soaked in those waters and uh, it was a very powerful experience because I did it because I I was desperate. But as I was in there and I had um, some really intentional music that I was playing, I, uh, and as I was like wailing and just, you know, completely beside myself in a way that was just out of control and just in agony. Uh, I just kind of like let the bath do the work that it could do for me. And on the other side of that bath, like toward the end of the bath, I realized that I was in the process of rebirth and what a powerful realization I was in the waters. I mean, it was like I was in the womb it just all downloaded to me. Like this is happening for me. I am in the process of being reborn and just let it happen, you know? And I would, I wouldn't have had the realization without, I think the bath. So anyway, perhaps some of your listeners will find that helpful, especially if you're in a period of really uh, intense suffering to consider the bath, but maybe for everyone else too, like who might not be in a, in a horribly agonizing season of life, to, you know, if you're wanting to get in touch more with this idea of rebirth in me and how do I recognize it? How do I see it? You know, perhaps do a ritual bath like that. And maybe it will open up, you know, insight and perspective to see things in your life that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. I love that. I'm immediately thinking about labor. (laughs) Yeah, right. And how painful labor can be before the joy on the other end. (laughs) I think it's an even example, though, of like, we share all the time, right? Hopefully, 
hopefully um, all of our listeners are showering regularly. Um, but it, that's really kind of going about <laughs> the so cleaning cool. of your body in a really efficient, like, got to like, I just got to knock out these things so I can get on with my day. And so to even recognize like the, the slowing that's required to take a bath and mm-hmm. the time you got to give an hour probably to it. You're not going to give seven minute shower. Um, I think is a, is a great simple example of um, some silent solitude and stillness for dummies, right? Which is what I was kind of asking about earlier. So I think that's a great example of something that most people could implement or give it give a try to. No one's ever gotten out of a bath and said that was a waste of time. <laughs> it's just, it's never, I don't think anyone's ever said that. <laughs> that's right? a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's something there. Mm. <laughs> Gosh, well, Felina, I feel like we could just keep going on and on. There's so many things to talk about, but I feel like I want to be respectful of time and this, what this conversation was to contain. And again, say thank you for being willing to share with us. Um, It's so special to have you, to see you and hear your voice and um, just connect with you again. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you for thinking of me. Eastlake is has always been and forever will be my most favorite spiritual community. I mean that every word of it. And uh, anytime I I get a chance to cross paths with you all uh, is very meaningful and um, heartwarming to me. So thanks for thinking of me. It's lovely to be with you both. Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com slash donate.